You are welcome to the Niger Filmmaker, a podcast about Nigerian filmmakers, their films, and how we can build a diverse and functional industry. I'm your host, Sele Gott. On this episode, my guest is Yemi Bamiro. He's a documentary filmmaker and he directed the Super Eagles 96 documentary, which is available on Amazon Prime Video. We talked about his formative years at MTV, making his first doc, One Man in His Shoes, for seven years, and his experience visiting Lagos to shoot the Super Eagles 96 documentary. If you're a new listener, you're welcome and I hope you enjoy. Hi, Yemi. You're welcome to the Niger Filmmaker. Hey, man. How you doing? Thanks for having me. All right. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, my name is Yemi Bamiro. Um, I'm the director of Super Eagles 96. Okay. So, um, I mean, before we get to the documentary, can we talk mm. about, like, your you know formative years as a filmmaker? Yeah, of course. Like, how did you... Um, starts. Okay, so I started. Uh, I started at MTV in London. Okay. So in around two thousand and four, two thousand and five. So that was my first like job in TV, and I didn't go to film school. I didn't study film as a degree or anything like that. But. Um, when I went to MTV, I started there as an intern. So I was there for five years and my first position, my first role was an intern. And it was a really great place to learn um, what you wanted to do because it was a bit like film school yeah. in the sense that they expected you to do everything. So they expected you to edit, to learn how to edit, to learn how to film, to learn how to write, whether that be scripts or interview questions. So over the five years that I was there, you got to do all of those things. And I think naturally I just gravitated towards um, the camera and, and, you know, filming things myself. Um, And then, yeah, I guess like mid twenties is when I really kind of like thought that I want to, you know, be a director. I think at that time at MTV, I was making short form content. Yeah. So, you know, like really short documentaries, like two or three minutes. Um, But I always had ambitions to sort of make longer, longer films. Um, So I, I'd always wanted to make like a feature eventually. Yeah. But it all, I I would argue that it, it all started at MTV because that was the training ground, I guess. Um, I, or, you know, when people go to film school, they study all of these different disciplines within the film. Yeah. And I feel that, yeah, MTV was basically that for me and lots of other people, you know, that were there feel the same way, you know, that, that you know, people that I kind of like started off with there are now directors or producers or writers. There's lots of writers, camera operators dops so yeah it was it was a really amazing place to sort of like learn and 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 sort of understand you know i guess the discipline of like making stuff yeah you know you some film schools are like one year courses or maybe two year courses but for you you had five years at mtv and what Mm. was the progression for you like you know before you left like how how did the responsibilities change over the years? Okay, yeah, that's a good question. So I started as an intern. So when you're an in, when I was an intern, I was kind of transcribing. So you know they would go out they would go out and do shoots, and then they bring the footage back, and then they'd want to take that footage into the edit. So I was basically just transcribing everything that had been shot, writing it down. So I did a lot of that, um, and then just going out on shoots and assisting. So, you know, assisting sort of like camera operators or directors and, you know, that that experience is just so valuable. So that's what I was doing sort of as an intern. And then after I finished my internship, I was lucky enough to uh, become a researcher. So when you're a researcher, you're basically, 
you know, I guess you're kind of like supporting the production in any, any way they need support in, in a junior capacity. Yeah. So I was like writing questions. I was like basically doing lots of the stuff that I was doing as an intern, but it was kind of formalized in the sense that I had a proper job now. Um, so I was a researcher and then I became an assistant producer yeah I think I became an assistant producer so that's more responsibility that's going out on shoots that's self-shooting that's like filming stuff and then taking it into the edit and then working with an editor and and then I think from AP I just started naturally directing some of the bigger you know shows and working with presenters and I don't I don't necessarily know you know if I was kind of like considered a director then but I think the act of what I was doing was basically directing yeah. um so yeah so when I left I I was basically directing um but it it was really informal it, I, I don't necessarily think it came with that label do you know what I mean I, I don't think in my head I thought oh I'm a director yeah because it was like you know I just have a camera and I'd go out and I'd film stuff I I was I, I more considered myself um maybe like a a shooting cameraman like a you know a shooting producer or something like that yeah. I didn't necessarily think I'm a director um but I think when I went so after I left MTV I went freelance and then that's when that you know I really kind of like formalized the director label you know because I was working for other companies and I was working for them in the capacity of a director so I was actually a director then but I think Phil, um, at MTV, it was, you know, it was definitely this training ground. And I think when I left, I had all the skills and I felt confident enough that I could go and work for other companies as a director because I'd had five years, you know, I guess, learning how to do it, you know? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that was basically the progression. Okay. Um, I mean, with short form content that is like two three minutes you know you have to mm. get to the point and then there's the other end of it that is um you know the feature length documentary space so um you know when you when you started making feature length documentaries you know you know approaching apart from researching coming up with questions knowing who like the subject of what you're trying to explore. Um, mm. Did you kind of work with scripts or how was that your process of, you know, making these documentaries? Okay, so you're talking about feature length. So yeah. I, my, my first feature length documentary was a film called uh, One Man in His Shoes. And One Man in His Shoes was basically about Air Jordan sneakers trainers so yeah. it's about the phenomenon of air jordan and sneakers that film took me seven years to make um because it was self-funded we self-funded it me and the producers and we made it over such a long period of time because we never had all of the money at one time to make the film mm. we would have to sort of like make some of the film and then stop get some more money and then make it and then also the whole film was set in America at the, t at the whole story is set in America. So we were going back and forth from to America for years. Yeah. So I, the process of making that film was, you know, I always knew what the story was, but the story at the beginning and the story at the end definitely changed at the beginning. I kind of like thought the film was just going to be about people that collect air Jordan trainers. So like, you know, collectors. Yeah. And, you know, I started to make that film. And then maybe after a year, I realized that that film wasn't that interesting. And then I was always interested in the, the mechanics of the brand and how Air Jordan had become this massive sort of uh, global multi-billion dollar company. I was interested in the men and the women who helped to make that happen not mm. just michael jordan himself like the executives at nike's the shoe designers the people that came up with the logos i was interested in those people and how they kind of like 
had masterminded this brand to turn it into this thing. So I started making that film. And I think it was just a really organic process. Like I had the idea. There wasn't a script per se. There was a treatment. Yeah. And I just, I just continued to sort of like, you know, make that film. I'd go back and forth to America. We'd interview lots of different people. And because we made it over a certain amount of time, over seven years, you know, there were people that, you know, said no in the beginning, but, you know, because we kept knocking at their door hmm. five years along the line, they were like, okay, yeah, like, you know, just <laughs> you've been knocking at our door for like five years so you can, we'll give you an interview. So it was, yeah. you know, so that, that was the process of making that film. So if someone had came along and sort of given me, a bag of money and said like make this film in two years it wouldn't have been the film that we ended up making yeah i think it actually is a better film because of the amount of time that it took to make you know because that that gave us you know it was frustrating those seven years because obviously you know no one wants to take that long to make a film you just want to make your film and then move on to the next one yeah but because it was such an ambitious project because we never really had the money because it was all in america it just turned into this i guess process that we you know at some point it gets you know you're too far in to turn back you know so it was never an option to stop making it or it was never an option to give up because it's kind of like you know three four years in you've committed all of this time you've committed all of this money yeah. You've just got to keep making it until it's finished. So that was the story of One Man in the Shoe. So there wasn't really a script. It was just there was an idea. There was a treatment. There was a, a list of people that we wanted to talk to. And I think, you know, that that film was made in the edit as well, I would argue. You mm. know, that because we had so much time in the edit. Because we'd go and film in America, we'd come back, we'd edit some, we'd leave it for a few months and then we go and film again. And that's how the film was made. Um, with Super Eagles, um, there, was a, there, there wasn't a script, but there was a story outline, Yeah, you know? So I wrote an outline of what I thought that the film should be. And then we sent that to the financiers and then they were like, yeah, this is great. And then they gave us the money and then that's the film that we ended up making. So. I think, yeah, for, with Super Eagles, it was more traditional. Like there was a, there was, there was a, a, I wouldn't say it was a script, but there was a story outline and that story outline basically detailed everything, exactly how we would make the film, how, what the film would look like, where we would shoot certain sequences. Yeah. Um, and, and that's basically what we ended up sort of making. Yeah. Okay, so just um run us through the um documentary commissioning, you know, space. Like how how do documentaries, you know, get born, you know, and then you know progress along that whole value chain? Mm, I don't think there's there's not one straight answer. I think my I can only talk on like my experience. Like for instance like with the Air Jordan film, like mm. nobody wanted to give me the money to make it, which is why it took seven years and which is why we kind of like self-funded it because, mm. you know, I tried to get money for it in a traditional way, um, but it didn't really work out. Like there are some sort of like film uh, finance bodies in the UK um, and we kind of tried to go down that road and it didn't really work out in the way that we kind of like needed it to work out but we did explore that you know so there are kind of like you know finance bodies and and sort of like film funds and you know but they're they're normally really oversubscribed because everybody kind of like wants money to make their film but yeah. we did actually get quite far down the road in that whole process but i guess this whole film was just it was really independent like a lot of films kind of like claim to be independent but this was a really independent film mm. you know where we got the money how we made the film so that was you know one one man in his shoes super eagles was more traditional so a producer in the uk came to me and said there's this idea knocking around what do i think and then she told me a little bit about it and then 
she basically I had a I had a phone call with the finance company and they were like we really like this idea would you be interested and I was like yeah of course so then I wrote what I thought the film should be and then sent it back to them and then it it, you know this this stuff never is like straightforward it it doesn't happen overnight yeah these conversations are over months um so they eventually came back and said yeah we've got the money to make it and we really want to make it and we just went straight into production after that so i think that is quite rare it's quite rare that you you know because documentaries are not a kind of you know i i think documentaries over the last couple of years have really come into their own in terms of like popularity because of you know the streamers and because of the popularity of Netflix and Amazon and Apple and stuff like that so there is there is a huge demand and appetite but I think you know there's also a kind of like a subsection where you know people are trying to make smaller films about smaller subjects and they don't know are going to be as popular or they don't know that are going to necessarily fit on a Netflix or an Amazon or, or, or an Apple or anything like that. So normally when that happens, the money comes from lots of different places, you know? So you make a doc, you want to make a documentary and the money comes from lots of different places, but with super Eagles, the money all came from one place. And also the company that financed it, you know, they make, they make feature films. They're like a studio. So their non-scripted division is really small. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I, I think it was, it was kind of like a perfect scenario how it happened. You know, it, it, that's not the norm. It doesn't normally happen like that. But I think we just kind of were fortunate that you know they they believed in the story and they were willing to sort of like back it financially, and and that's how it happened. So to sort of like finish answering your question. Um, once we made the film, we had to tr- we had to sell it. Do you mm. know what I mean? So like the the company gave us all the money to make it, but it wasn't a commission. So it's not like Netflix said we really love this film and we're going to give you the money to make it. It's like MRC are the name of the they're the they're the finance company slash studio, mm. and they were like we love this story, so here's the money to make it, and we we're, we're sell it when the film is made. So once we'd made the film, there's a whole other process of like trying to sell it. Uh, to different territories, different companies, broadcasters, streamers. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much how that film was kind of like made. Like, thankfully, Amazon basically bought the film after we made it. So, that's that's where it that's basically where it lives now on Amazon Prime. Okay. All right. So, like with the independent approach to documentary filmmaking and you know with the example of one man and his shoes at what Mm. point do you know that the documentary like you've kind of reached the end you need to wrap things up well i think with okay so with with one man in his shoes i think because we made that film over such a long period of time yeah we knew kind of like exactly who we needed in the film to tell the story. Mm. So once we got those people, we were pretty sure that the film was kind of done. But then also the film, that film got into a, f- a few film festivals. Yeah. So it got, it got into South by Southwest in America. It got into London Film Festival. It, yeah, it played at a film, a few, a film, a few film festivals, right? So, I think South by was the first film festival that it got in. So there was obviously a deadline that you have to submit your film. Yeah. So at that point you can't work on your film anymore because otherwise we're going to miss the deadline. So that kind of, we were informed and we were kind of like, our hand was kind of like, you know, pushed by the fact that we've got this, we've got this deadline for this film festival and we have to finish the film. So, um, but I think, in our case, the film was finished before it was before like South by Southwest came along. Do you know what I mean? It was the the story of the film. But then there's all the final post, there's the mix, there's the grade, there's the sort of like 
you know, all of the all of the final post wasn't done, obviously, but the, the actual kind of like, you know, the offline of the film and 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 you know, we weren't filming anymore, like ahead of South by coming along and saying that they wanted the film. So we all knew that the film was finished. Um, and that was that was kind of like informed by the fact that we we'd got everybody that we needed yeah. to tell the story. So yeah. Okay. So at the at the heart of, you know, storytelling for you, what kind of stories do you enjoy um telling? Um I love stories that kind of um I love stories that are kind of that I can connect to in the sense that if I'm a fan of the story, then that is going to be my entry point into the story. Yeah. So with one man in his shoes, I was always interested in trainer culture, sneaker culture. I was always, you know, I was a Chicago Bulls fan when I was like 13 or 14 years old. Like yeah. it was stuff that I would read about and watch anyway. So you have a really natural entry point into the subject. And that's how I sort of like choose the films that I want to make. I think you have to kind of be a fan. Yeah. In, you know, for me, I have to be really interested in it because these films take years to make. So if you're not interested in something, you know, it's going to be hard for you to kind of like make it over the course of two, three years of your life if mm. you're if you have no interest in the subject. So I always try to make films about subjects that I'm naturally a fan of, things that I gravitate to naturally, things that, you know, even if I wasn't involved, if it, you know, if a film was made about it, I would probably watch it. Yeah. You know, so that's that's how I choose stories that I'm interested in. And, and that ranges from everything. That's like sport, um, social history, um, I guess, music. I'm, I'm kind of like naturally, those are those are the things that I'm interested in. I'm, and I'm a fan of those are the things that I consume on a daily basis. So yeah. I'm always trying to think of ideas and stories within that world, you know? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's take a bit of a detour. Um, can you mention mm. three random facts about yourself? Three random facts? Wow. Um, Okay, so when we shot Super Eagles, uh, that was the first time I'd ever been to Lagos. Okay. So that's one fact, right? So, so Lagos or in... Nigeria as a whole? No, I've been to Nigeria before, but I'd never been to Lagos. Okay. That was the first time. So we shot, so all of the recreation scenes that we shot in the film, well, basically the whole film was shot in Lagos, like yeah. 80 80% of the film was shot in Lagos because that's where all of our crew were that's where we arranged to sort of like film all of the players hmm. so yeah that so what was that uh july 2021 so that's the first time i'd ever been to lagos um another fact so i guess another thing about me like i f for a long time i was convinced that i wanted to be like a, a music journalist up until i was like 18 or 19 years old hmm. i wanted to be a music journalist like I was writing for a paper in the UK called The Voice, which yeah. is a black newspaper. And, you know, I was working on the arts desk. I was interviewing sort of like musicians and like reviewing films. And I was kind of like convinced that that's what I wanted to do. Um, and then, and then sort of, yeah, I kind of like changed tack a little bit and, and sort of decided that I just wanted to work in some sort of job in music yeah. after I, uh, after I realized that it'd be really hard to sort of like sustain a life and a career as a music journalist. Cause I didn't want to be an editor. Hmm. I thought being an edit and like a, being an editor of a music publication might be a pretty dry job. So for me personally, not for anybody that is an editor of a music publication, but just for me, I just wanted to write. So yeah, when I realized that, I didn't really want to do that. I thought, what else could I do? And that's when I sort of like, you know, started thinking about MTV. 
basically. Yeah. So that's another fact. The fir- a third fact about me. So one man in his shoes took seven years to make, right? Yeah. But there's a character in the film that took two years to get involved. Okay. Um, so I had to convince him to basically do an interview with me. So his name is Sonny Vaquero, and he was basically a Nike executive that was quite instrumental in Nike uh, signing Michael Jordan to his um, uh, endorsement deal yeah. in, ni- in, in sort of like 1984. And I had a chat with him initially. I was introduced to him and I had a chat with him in like 2016. And he's like, yeah, yeah, like come to America, come to Palm Springs and sort of like film with me. Yeah. And I was like, yes, that's amazing. And then he called me back about a week later and said, oh, it's not, I like, it's not a good time. And I was like, oh, like, okay, when, when will be a good time? And he was like, I'll let you know. And I basically, it took another two years for yeah. him to agree to do an interview. So I was, I would email him every six months to see if he was ready to do an interview. And then I think, in, at the end of 2018, 2019, no, at the end of 2018, early 2019, he kind of agreed to do it. Yeah. So I went and I met him and he was really nice. And then I ended up going back to see him a year later and we did another interview. And yeah, those two interviews are in the film. So that's not really a fact about me. That's just a fact about the film. But yeah, those are three facts, basically. Okay. All right. I guess, um, you know, this particular Super Eagles cohort was probably the most exciting in Nigeria's history. Um, as a young boy, did you follow um, their matches over the years? Yeah, yeah. So I was, I was 13 years old when um, the Super Eagles won Olympic gold in 1996 in Atlanta. And I remember it vividly. I remember what it was like in my house in London. I remember my mum calling back home to talk to talk to her brothers and her sisters and everybody just going crazy. I remember people, other Nigerians coming around to our house and everybody watching the matches. So I remember that energy. You know, I remember how excited everybody was. So the objective for the film was to make sure that there was some of that represented in the film. Some yeah. of what I felt as a 13 year old in 1996, watching those games, I wanted to kind of like make sure that that, that, that excitement, that kind of um, that anticipation was represented in the film, Yeah, you know, because that, that was a feeling that everybody felt like, you know, since making the film, I've spoken to so many people that you know are, are really nostalgic about that time yeah and and when those games were on where they were you know what their families were doing how they were watching the matches so i just wanted to make sure that we captured some of that and that was communicated and represented in the film um because that's important that's what made that team so that you know those that team and those players made us all feel like that you yeah, know so yeah. it was really important that you know we represented it in the right way okay so apart from lagos where else in nigeria have you been to just the Buja. okay you know nigeria has its issues and um sometimes when you know it's time for football Mm. It tends to be football that brings the whole country together. What other things for you as a British-born Nigerian do you think kind of unites the country? Excellence. It doesn't matter in what field. It doesn't matter. It could be, you know, it could be, a, you know, uh, a Nigerian-American that has sort of like soared in America or it could be sort of, it's just excellence. It's just any representation of Nigerian excellence anywhere in the world unites Nigerians because yeah. that's all what we aspire to be. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. 
yeah. and we feel proud of that. So we, you know, I think the Super Eagles is only one facet of that excellence, but it could be anything. It could mm. be, you know, an amazing sort of like uh, advocate or politician or sort of like chess player or, you know, musician, like look a fella, like he brings us all together. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like his music, like the representation of that, like Afro beats, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's just excellence. Like, you know, I, I think a, uh, a craftsmanship at its highest yeah. just unites Nigerians because we're proud people mm. and we like to see ourselves represented in the right way. But I think excellence, excellence is the pinnacle do you know what I mean? That's what we all aspire to as Nigerians, as Africans. Do you know what I mean? So that brings us together. Any representation, any embodiment of excellence. Mm. Okay. Um, so now into into the documentary. Um, mm. Especially the beginning, like I feel the first few minutes of the um, documentary pre- pretty much like set up what we were to you know, expect with the documentary, you know, um, with all the footage you shot in Lagos and the interviews, um, and then, you know, laying all that against the political backdrop. Um, is this something that, you know, just kind of came in the edits? Like, how how did that happen? No, no, it, <laughs> it didn't come in the edit. We knew, we knew that we wanted to tell the story. So we knew that we couldn't tell the story without exploring the political landscape of Nigeria in the 90s because those two things collide in the film, you know? So we knew that we were going to always tell the political side and we were never going to shy away from that Mm. because we knew that we could make the football story work because the the football story is amazing. Like, you you know, it's this um, once-in-a-generation sort of like group of players that go to America and win Olympic gold. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are, you can tell that story. That, that story is going to be good. Mm. Do you know what I mean? But that story needed context. And, and, and we needed to make sure that that story, you know, told the full, um, you know, it, it, was, it was full and it was plotted out. So I, I just knew that we couldn't tell this football story without the political landscape. So, yeah, it was always planned that we would kind of like explore it in the way that we did. It was, I think, the, the challenge in the edit was just to make sure that those two things, the politics and the football, were quite seamless in the way that they um, interconnected with one another. You know, so you didn't want it to feel like two different films, like yeah. the football here and the politics. Mm. We didn't want them to be separate. We ne- we wanted them to be together and we wanted to interweave the social political story into the um into the football story. Yeah. Um so that that I it wasn't a challenge but we it just took some work, you know, to get it right, to make sure that it, you, you know, it really worked. So um you know sometimes when making a documentary you have one subject to focus on and other times um, something that involves a lot of parts. Like, um, mm. I think with, with um, one man and his shoes, mm. that, that could, you, could, you could say that the main character is, you know, the Air Jordans and then you build the world around that. And even with this one, you could say the main idea is, you know, um, the Super Eagles team of, that won the 96 and then every other thing comes out of that. Is it always good to have these central ideas that kind of focuses every other, um, you know, interview and everything to kind of keep the documentary strong? Because if, if you're dealing with a big subject and you're just jumping from different characters, you know, it can, you know, the idea can be lost. Um, Yeah. Yeah, no, completely. It's a really good question. Yeah, I think that you should have a central sort of like focus. Um, you, you know, you should almost have like a thesis. Like this is this is basically the story. Yeah. And this is how we're going to tell the story. And 
I think that because it, it helps focus what the film is, mm. you know, obviously you should be open to sort of, you should be open to change, particularly in the edit room. You know, sometimes you, you try things that work on paper and they worked when you went out to film them, but you get into the edit and then they don't work. So yeah. you've got to kind of react to that a little bit, but I think, yeah, you should definitely have a focus and, a, and I guess a thesis of like what this film is, how it's, how we're going to tell it, who it's going to involve. Yeah. Like, is there, is there sort of like, is there a, is there a, is a time scale in terms of like when this story takes place? Yeah. Because that's always helpful if you can sort of like, you know, when are we telling this story from like, from a date's perspective, when does this story start and when does this story end? Do you know what I mean? Yeah. That's really important. With Super Eagles, it was quite straightforward because I guess we did touch on the sort of like the 80s, but I guess the, the key kind of like narrative from a date's perspective was like 93 to 96. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? And, and looking at everything that happened within those three years. Um, and, and that, you know, we always knew that. We knew that we would have to touch on sort of like 1980 and, and sort of like 94 and you know like do a little bit of exposition yeah. build the world like ex, you know really communicate what this team represented not just in the 90s but prior to the 90s um but yeah I think at the heart of everything was just the thesis there was like you know this is the story this is how we're going to tell it and if there's anything outside of you know, these dates or this thesis, then we're not necessarily going to explore it in the way that we kind of are going to explore our key kind of like narrative, our, our key thesis, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's how we approached it. When we got into the edit, it was pretty much the same, yeah. you know? We didn't really deviate too far away from what we'd kind of like set out from in the beginning. So, yeah, I think you're right. I think it helps to kind of like have just kind of like a train of thought, like quite clear in terms of like what you're exploring. Yeah. Because I, I think that just helps, that just helps with cohesion, you know, when it comes to the film, like it's coherent. We know exactly what we're looking at. We know exactly what we're exploring. We know the dates that we're looking at. Yeah. And we know the characters. So you're not necessarily going to go too far away from, you know, that key narrative, you yeah. know, because if it doesn't add to the story and it doesn't, if it doesn't drive the narrative, then, you know, it's not that useful to you. So, yeah. Okay. Um, you know, from your days as a researcher at MTV and, mm. you know, through all the documentaries you have made, um, what are some tools that you use? Is it, do you just like do web searches you know, to kind of come up with ideas and different things to support your documentary? What other things you do? Uh, I, I read loads. I read so much. Um, I think it's, I think just reading and just understanding different perspectives, because it, when you're reading a book, like most of the time it's told through the perspective of the author. Yeah. And then that, you know, that's based on research as well. But I, I kind of like drawing from different sources. So I try to read lots. Um, and then, yeah, I, I guess that's, that's the key. And then I just watch other films. Mm. Like not necessarily, you know, films in the same sort of world. So like, I, I think for, the, for Super Eagles, I remember I watched the, um, I'd seen it before, but I rewatched it a few times, the Diego Maradona film okay. that Asif Kapilia directed. Yeah. Um, because I, I love that film for the way that they cut the football sequences, you know, because mm. they were they were cut in such a compelling way, you know. It just felt like, I guess, the equivalent of an action scene mm. in the, in you know the way that they'd edited those football sequences. So I watched that film a few times because I kind of like wanted us to make sure that we could achieve something similar with the football sequences like the games that, that were really dramatic, yeah. you know, I, I just thought there was a tension and an energy to the way 
that those scenes were cut in Maradona that I kind of wanted us to have in Super Eagles. Yeah. Um, and then what else did I watch? I think I watched the Pele film on Netflix and I watched that film because they kind of like deal with social history as well. Mm. Um, you know, stuff that was going on in Brazil that was kind of like running parallel to Pele's upward trajectory as a football player. So I kind of like wanted to see the way that they handled that as well. So I guess watching films and, and reading is really useful. Reading from a kind of like a story perspective, a research perspective, and then watching films from a story perspective as well, but just also like visual uh, considerations and like a visual approach and like how other films have handled subjects that are similar to the ones that we were looking at in Super Eagles. So I guess those would be the two things, like yeah, reading and 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 just watching lots of other films that kind of like live in the same world as the film that we're making. Yeah. Okay. Um, for for this documentary, you know, archival footage played a very huge role, and I'm sure like it helped that you you know got all the funding you needed from one financier. Um, <laughs> How much of a hole in your budget the archival footage take? <laughs> I would say probably three quarters. Wow. If not half, yeah. Because like you you've got to remember the archive footage came from FIFA. FIFA are the only they're the only people that have World Cup footage. Yeah. And then also the Olympics footage came from the Olympics company. And they're the only people that have that footage, so they can charge what they like. Yeah. And if you watch the film, you can't tell you can't tell the story without the World Cup footage. You can't tell the you can't tell the story without um, uh, USA '94, which was uh, Nigeria's first time at the World Cup. You can't you can't tell the story without that footage. Yeah. And we can't tell the you know you can't tell that you can't tell the story of the Olympics without Olympics footage. So the archive budget was crazy. Yeah. It was like huge. Yeah. I don't know if it was three quarters, but I know it was definitely half. Maybe more than, maybe slightly more than half. Okay. Yeah. Did you also have to kind of, you know, slow it down a bit with the amount of archival footage you're using? No. Like, that's what I mean. Like, when I say we were really fortunate because we were really... The people that paid for the film supported the film. Yeah. And they realized that you couldn't tell you couldn't tell the story without the footage. So yeah. I never I never felt like we were restricted in the archive because it was key to telling the story. Hmm. I think, you know, but there's also a lot of commercial music. There's like free there's like free fella tracks. Hmm. Um there's like there's there's loads of other kind of like uh, West African um, music in the film, so I feel that we had to we had to be quite strict with who we were going to use and how we were going to use that because we didn't have an unlimited budget, you yeah. know, for, for 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 music. But I feel for archive, I think it was clear, and we were all on the same page that it was really important to have all of that footage yeah. in order to tell the story. So I don't remember there being too much back and forth on what we could and what we couldn't use. Yeah. Uh, but I know that there were conversations about, well, you know, if we're going to spend all of this money on sort of like archive footage, we can't spend loads of money on mon on, on music. Mm. Um, so thankfully we had a really amazing like music supervisor, Klee, um, and yeah, I think the archive team also did an amazing job as well. Um, but yeah, I think I think people always underestimate how much archive footage costs. Yeah, like there's a there's a reason why you don't see lots of documentaries um, about the Olympics because the Olympics footage is really expensive. Yeah. Um, so yeah. Okay. So um, let's talk about the shoot in Lagos. Um, this was mm. your first time in Lagos. How was that experience? Amazing. I love Lagos so much, man. Like we had an amazing fixer. Um, yeah, he was he was an amazing guy. 
and he just we had the best local crew um we were looked after um all of the people all of the, all of the people that participated in the um reconstruction scenes were locals so the boys under the third uh, mainland bridge they play football there anyway so when we went and wreckied it like a few days before the shoot they were there playing so yeah. we just asked them if they can come back like next week and you know we'd pay them and they could be in the film and they were good uh when we went to makoko um all of those people local obviously um i just loved it lagos is just uh, it's like an assault on your senses mm. everywhere you look something's happening in yes yeah. <laughs> it's crazy man i loved it so much i kind of i want to go back yeah. it was just a joy to be there like all of the crew were so good everybody was just on board with the story like the weather we were blessed the things that we had to shoot outside it was dry when we shoot when we shot inside it rained mm. and you know the weather never interrupted any of the things that we were shooting yeah um yeah i loved it it's 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 a beautiful chaotic crazy city yeah <laughs> but i love it i'm proud I'm proud to sort of be from there you know um, yeah mm. Okay. Um okay so at this point another detail. Um let's yeah. say you were stuck on an island and you had only one movie or TV series to watch which one would it be? Um I think if it was one TV series it'd be The Wire. Okay. What do you love about The Wire? It's just the storytelling man. It's it's just some of the best storytelling in TV ever. The characters is just yeah, in my opinion, the best TV series ever made. Yeah. Um. So yeah, if so, Desert Island one TV series, it definitely be The Wire. Uh, did you say one movie? I mean, you can choose a movie too. Uh. So, I think a movie. Probably Hoop Dreams. Okay. So Hoop Dreams, documentary by a filmmaker called Steve James, um, sort of about these two college kids that are trying to make it to the NBA in Chicago. Mm. Just incredible film. Took like 10 years to make. Um, just a, a, a amazing storytelling. It's just kind of like the, it's like the standard for kind of, you know, verite, observe, observational sort of like filmmaking. Mm. You know, it's an incredible film. So yeah, The Wire and Hoop Dreams, I reckon. Okay. And um, are there particularly any, you know, documentary filmmakers that inspire you, that inspire your work? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Like, so Steve James, who I just mentioned, he's from Chicago. He's made a lot of seminal just just incredible seminal work like hoop dreams interrupters uh head games just like a, he's just a really amazing filmmaker mm. um there's another filmmaker called alex gibney who i really rate he's he's prolific he never stops making films mm. he's always making films he makes them at such a rapid sort of frequency i don't really know how he does it yeah. Um I like Khalil Joseph as well. Khalil Joseph's more like experimental. Yeah. Like vis visually experimental, but he's just incredible. Like the way that he shoots. Um I think black skin is just incredible. Uh who else? Like obviously Spike as well. Spike Lee. Mm. I think people don't talk about Spike Lee's documentary work enough. I think that it's because he's such an amazing like narrative like filmmaker, but yeah. his documentary work is just incredible. Like I remember the first time I saw like when the levees broke about New Orleans and Hurricane Katrina. Mm. 
I was just completely blown away um, by that. And some of his other doc work is just, yeah. Um, so definitely Spike. Um, Ava DuVernay, I think her, her documentary work, obviously 13th. 13th is just incredible. Mm. Everyone knows that. Um, just an amazing storytelling. So yeah, I, I'd say, yeah, those filmmakers definitely inspire me. Oh, okay. The presence of streamers had, has kind of made, has kind of reduced the um, barriers to films being seen globally. Um, have you mm. been following Nigerian movies that have been released on streamers? Um, honestly, no, not that. I no, not not that much. I think that having sort of you know, I think when we sold or when we were talking about selling Super Eagles, I think, you know, I know that there's a big focus in Africa on local sort of programming yeah. in that respective sort of uh, country. So when we were having con uh, conversations about where the film would go, obviously like Nigeria isn't like a no brainer, but I think through those conversations, I kind of became aware of, you know, obviously I know how big, you know, film and TV is in, in Nigeria, but mm. I think it crossing over and it sort of like penetrating on a global scale, I, I feel like we're still, we're still on that upward trajectory to get to that place. But yeah, I think when you have, you know, 250 million Nigerians, it's like you don't, you don't need to sort of go global. You already are in your own country. Do you yeah. know what I mean? So I think that, um, yeah, and I think that was testament to sort of like how easy the shoot was when we were in Lagos. Mm. It was it was like really straightforward. Like everybody was on it. All of the kind of like, all of the crew were just amazing because they're so used to like making commercials or making music videos or working on TV shows. And I, so I, you know, cause I think there's a perception, you, you know, like you go to sort of places in Africa and like, you know, the crew are not going to be as good as like places in Europe or whatever, or in America. Like, mm. yeah, that's like such rubbish, man. Like, because the crew that we had were just insane. They were so good. And, and, and I, I knew they were going to be good as well, you know? So yeah, I guess to answer your question. Yeah. I, I know that there are inroads being made on a global scale in terms of like Nigerian programming and Nigerian shows. Um, and yeah, I, I'm kind of, I think it's good. It's good for all of us, you know, that these things are getting attention and yeah. these shows are successful um, because that just means that more of us will get a chance to sort of, you know, make that stuff mm. or, or sort of have conversations about, you, you know, making similar content, you know, because I think we already have a body of work. We, we're already really good at what we do. So. Yeah. Okay. So um, are you currently working on anything? Yeah, I'm working on a series for Disney Plus. Um, it's about music. So it's a four-part music series. Um, I, I'm only directing one episode. It's about Camden. Mm. So Camden obviously is a small sort of like borough, I guess, here in North, in London. Yeah. But it's over the years, it's been renowned for um, its music lots of different music has come out of this small little place in North London. Um, it has amazing music venues that over the years, incredible artists have played in. Yeah. So the series is about the musical legacy and the heritage of Camden. Um, and yeah, I've been on this job since November. It's really fun. I used to work in Camden. So when I said that I used to work at MTV, mm. MTV was in Camden. Um, so I kind of have a connection to Camden. Um, yeah. And I don't, I don't think it's going to be out this year. I think it's going to be out early next year. Mm. Um, but yeah, it's a really, it's been a really fun series to work on so far. Okay. Yeah. And, um, you know, where can people go to keep up with, um, news about your latest releases? <laughs> That's funny. My latest releases. Um, 
I put everything on my website. So yeah. it's just yemibamiro.com. So I put everything there. I kind of, yeah, I've, I've become quite good at keeping it updated. Um, so yeah, I post all of my work um, on there or just on my Instagram, which is just my name, Yemi Vermeer, at Yemi Vermeer. So yeah. Okay. All right. Thanks, Yemi, for coming on the Niger Filmmaker. Thank you for having me. Really enjoyed my yeah. time. Same here. We have come to the end of this episode. Remember to rate and review the podcast. You can also follow me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at Selego Film and the podcast at the Niger Film Pod to share your feedback. You can now support the podcast by visiting the website to donate. See you on the next episode. Have a good one.